You know, one thing I forgot to let you know of when I was making that n announcement about the uh, Intro to the Bible seminar that we're doing, um, one of the cool things about that is simultaneous to that, down the hall, if you have elementary age kids, um, our children's ministry staff is going to be putting on a similar kind of thing, but for kids. Um, that I think is good. it not only makes it possible for sometimes us as adults, because we've got to figure out what to do with our kids, but also just to ground them in that as well. So we're excited about that opportunity, and we hope you can be a part of that. Um, I don't know if you can ever experience this or not, but from time to time, my wife um, has the opportunity to get away on kind of like a, a girls' weekend sort of trip. Um, she'll, she has these college friends, and actually some that go all the way back to high school that have just been some of her best friends through life, and they've moved around the country, and so this group of friends will plan kind of like an extended weekend away and, and get together and just go um, invest in each other and catch up, and she loves it, and it's always just really energizing for her. Um, but on the flip side of that, um, it means an alternative reality for me that weekend um, without her. And so one of the things that she does to kind of help sort of prepare is she will leave this detailed sheet of instructions about the things that need to get done. And my wife and I don't have like this really sort of clearly um, delineated like roles in our marriage. It's not like I always take out the garbage and she always does the dishes and we, we both kind of share whatever needs to get done. But in terms of managing the family schedule, that is her um, almost exclusively. And so she will give me this like um, document of who needs to be where at what time and where they're going and what phone numbers I need. And at first it's almost like insulting, right? You're kind of like, I've got Sherry, I've got this, you know, I can do this, this sort of thing. But 17 minutes into her being gone, like um, I'm completely lost and like studying the document and highlighting things and all of that sort of stuff. And she'll almost always sit down with me right before she goes and have a conversation and go over it and say, I, I need to prepare you for my departure. Like, I, I need you to be ready for me to be gone. And it's interesting because last Sunday we were celebrating the resurrection. We had this awesome, amazing Easter service here. It was so incredible to be with all of you as we were just worshiping God and thanking him for overcoming sin and death. And it was just a great morning. But if we back up just slightly from that, what we discover is that Jesus is sitting down with his disciples and he's helping them and he's teaching them and he's saying, I need to prepare you for me to be gone. I, I need to get you ready for this. And as he's doing that, essentially what he starts to teach them on, at least one of the fundamental things that he teaches them on and he comes back to again and again and again is the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. This morning, we are beginning a new series on that very topic, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, who he is, what he does, his role in our lives. And so over the course of the next nine weeks together, we are going to look at a variety of different passages that help describe who the Holy Spirit is and, and will enable us to grow in our understanding of his role in our lives as we seek to follow Jesus. So if Jesus is saying, hey, I, when I am gone, I need to give you someone who's going to help you, and he tells us that that's going to be the Holy Spirit, it would make sense that as followers of Jesus 2,000 years after he ascended into heaven, he conquers the grave, ascends into heaven, that we would need to understand and know who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. So personally, I am excited for this series. I'm excited to look at this together. I'm excited to grow in my own understanding and awareness of his role in my life, his activity in us, and I'm excited for us collectively as Chapel Street Church, Mill Creek, for him to do the same in, in us as a community, as a group. I want to see the implications of that. My daughter um, was riding with me in the car this week and asking me what I was preaching on. I told her we're starting a new series on the Holy Spirit, and she goes, oh, Dad, that's awesome. The Holy Spirit is one of the coolest things out there. Um, so good news for us. Uh, he, he is one of the coolest things out there. On the flip side of this, if I'm being entirely honest with you, the Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity that, that is the most mysterious and unpredictable to me. God the Father God the Son and the person of Jesus, for whatever reason, they have seemed more tangible, more concrete to me. 
But the, the Holy Spirit, God as the Holy Spirit, feels more abstract, more, more nebulous. And so, and I, I'm, this is not right, but I'm telling you, at, at times the way I've kind of thought about the Holy Spirit in my faith journey is sort of like that, 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 that family member or that uh, friend that we all have that can be a little bit unpredictable and you're never, gonna, you're never sure if they're going to show up. And if they do show up, you're a little bit nervous about what they might do. Like I, I, Some of you won't relate to that at all. But I think others of you will, as, as you think about how you have thought about and viewed the Holy Spirit throughout the course of your faith journey. But as I think about my own story and growing in my understanding of the Holy Spirit in my life, I've also recognized that I need to be aware of my misconceptions. I need to be aware of my misunderstandings in order to grow in the truth of who he really is. And I, I do, I, I do get the sense that I'm not the only one. Um, that I'm not the only one who sometimes has more questions than they do answers regarding the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So whether it's in conversations that I've had with some of you or just friends sitting around or observing the church in action throughout the course of my participation in the church, really in my life, I'm convinced that, that either fear or, or comfort or just a plain lack of of understanding has caused so many Christians to relegate the Holy Spirit to a, an insufficient role in their lives, in our lives, in our faith. And so as a result, we can live just unaware of his activity or, or we can be unresponsive to his leading. Again, others of you, this is not your story. This is not your history. And, and I get that, but I think some of you, many of you may relate, at whether that's a current reality for you or, or part of your faith journey in the past, to sort of viewing things that way. Francis Chan, who is the author of a book entitled Forgotten God, he's a, a formerly was a pastor, he wrote this book about the Holy Spirit, um, and that, t that title obviously implies that this is the person of the Trinity that the church has is, is maybe ignored or been unaware of. But he kind of makes this point with, with a hypothetical situation. He writes in the introduction to his book, imagine if you grew up on a deserted island with nothing but the Bible to read. Then, after 20 years, you are rescued and attended a modern-day church. Chances are you'd be shocked. There is a fairly big gap between what we read in Scripture about the Holy Spirit and how most believers and most churches operate today. He goes on to say, if I were Satan and my ultimate goal was to thwart, uh, thwart God's kingdom and purposes, one of my main strategies would be to get the churchgoers to ignore the Holy Spirit. It's an interesting implication. It's an interesting idea that, that Chan suggests. And I can say emphatically um, that we do not want to be a church, a community where we are missing out on what God has for us. We don't want to be a place where we're missing out on what God is going to do through us because of, of, of just ignorance or because of um, being unaware of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So our objective together over these next several weeks is to grow in our awareness of the Holy Spirit and in our ability to live according to the Spirit. And that's what we're going to begin to look at today. Um, we're going to look at the words of Jesus. And before we do that, just so you know, over these nine weeks, um, just in the office space to my left, right over here, while we're in here reading and, and studying and opening up God's word and talking through this together, there's going to be um, at least someone, maybe multiple people in that room praying for us, that we would be open to the Holy Spirit's leading, that we would be receptive to his guiding in our lives, and that we would hear from him. Um, and so let's join them in that real quick. Father, we do pray this morning that as your Holy Spirit is here with us now, that we would be open and ready to, to hear from your word and to let truth penetrate our hearts by his work. Do this in us, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. This is John chapter 14. Just two verses this morning that I want to introduce us to. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Verse 16 and 17, he says, I will ask the Father, 
and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. See, this, this, these verses, these two verses are a part of the Gospel of John, chapter 13 through 17, that's commonly referred to as the upper room discourse. This is Jesus doing the very thing that we just talked about, preparing his disciples for his departure, for what comes next. And as he does so, he wants to teach them, instruct them on, on the coming of the Holy Spirit. A couple of things I want us to draw out of this text this morning, and that is first, just the awareness of or acknowledgement of the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit. I, uh, I love, one of the things I love about being a dad is opportunities, and, and really being a husband too, but opportunities when you can surprise your spouse or surprise your kids with something unexpected, something that you know is going to be so valuable or important to them. For instance, uh, a few years ago, we had the opportunity to take our family for the summer down to Disney. And so prior to that, Sherry and I at Christmas time wrapped up a gift and put it under. It was kind of labeled for all three of the girls. And it had a little Disney t-shirt in and the, the ears and um, all this stuff to kind of like announce to them or to share with them that, that, that we were going to go to Disney together as a family. And as they were like starting to unwrap this gift, like I could hardly contain myself, right? I was like, this is so exciting, you know, just watching them and their reaction and how how much they were, I knew, going to be looking forward to this and all these unexpected things that we were going to be given. And this is the surprise. And this is almost the tone that I hear as I read these words from Jesus in these verses. I, I hear the heart of someone who knows just how good and how important, how essential it is the Holy Spirit is going to be to his followers, for his disciples. I hear this sort of the, the surprise of the unexpected. And even though they don't understand it, they, they don't get it in this moment. They don't know the impact of what Jesus is promising here, but he does. In fact, if you, we're going to look at this next week, but if you were to turn over just two, two chapters to chapter 16 in the Gospel of John, verse 7, Jesus says this. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Like I said, we're going we're to dig more into this next week. But for just this moment, let's try to wrap our heads around these, the boldness of Jesus' words here. Of, of this promise. What could be better than walking beside Jesus? What, what, what could be better than, than watching him perform miracles and, and teach the masses? What could be better than, than, than watching Jesus take all these broken and hurting people and restore them back into this incredible relationship with God? What could be better than that? But according to Jesus and his words, what is better is that this helper comes and is with us that the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us. This is, a, this is an amazing promise. So if we go back now to chapter 14. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. So there, there, there's a couple things that I just want to highlight real quick here about the nature of this promise. First, I just want us to understand the certainty of this. I want us to understand the certainty of what Jesus is telling us here. As a Christ follower, how do you and I know that we've been given the Holy Spirit? How, how do we have confidence that, that he is dwelling in us and with us? Because everything that Jesus promised us, he will do and has done. I mean, this is what we talked about last week when we were talking about how the resurrection validates the promise of Jesus. Our confidence is, is emboldened by the fact of an empty tomb. We, we have confidence, there's certainty, Jesus promised it and he fulfilled it. So if you've placed your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, according to Jesus in verse 17, he will dwell with you and will be in you. And the second thing, in addition to this certainty though, is that I also recognize there's no, there's no qualifications here. 
And I, I normally don't make a great deal about what the verses don't say, but this, this sort of speaks into, I think, some of the misconceptions that I've had over my life, things that I have had a tendency to believe. For instance, simply that there is a certain degree of spiritual qualification, a, a, a certain um, spiritual maturity level that I have to arrive at before the Holy Spirit will really be activated in my life, before he's really involved. So what this creates then is I can look at the person next to me and be like, well, it makes perfect sense that the Holy Spirit speaks to Allie. I mean, Allie is super spiritual and she's much more mature than I am and all these sorts of things. And, and, and I can do that and sort of create this expectation in me that it's likely that I'm not there yet. And so I shouldn't anticipate to, to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit. But there's no, there's no, that's not here. We create that in ourselves. Um, the only stipulation that we see scripture put on this is that we've put our faith in Jesus, that we're connected through him. And if that's true, if that is the case, then, then we are recipients of Jesus's promise in these verses. But then thirdly, th th there's also, and this is similar, but there's also no mention of a degree. And what I mean by that is, is this promise isn't delivered in segments. You don't, you're not given like a introductory dose of the Holy Spirit. There's no, there's no beginner level that we start out with to see if we can handle it okay. And, and no, that's, that's not what Scripture teaches us. It's not about leveling up. We're not in some sort of spiritual video game. That, that ultimately arrives in increased doses of the Holy Spirit. The promise is delivered in full to us. It's, it's our awareness, our understanding of his leading and guiding in our life that grows. It's our ability to listen and to pay attention, to recognize his activity of his presence in us. So it's saying, it's, understand this, if you are a follower of Jesus this morning, then you have been given the Holy Spirit, and you have been given him in full. This is what Jesus wants us to understand. And additionally, though, he wants us to understand who the person of the Holy Spirit is, the person of the Holy Spirit. Well, look, we, the question, one of the most common questions that relates to the Holy Spirit is, who, who is he? Who is he really? And I think it's important to, to acknowledge that the question of who matters it matters to us. When I was a sophomore at Moody, uh, some of my floor mates had the bright idea of like posting in this, um, this stairwell window that, that went out towards the girls' dorms next to us. They, they had this uh, sign that they posted in the window that said, please send brownies. Um, so a girls' floor did send brownies, um, but they were trying to teach us a lesson. So they put something in the brownies that was not good for our digestive system um, overall. And you could spot a guy from Colby 11 the next day um, for all day. Because you'd see like in the middle of class, the professor's lecturing, all of a sudden you'd see somebody get and kind of like hurry out quickly. Like that was someone from, from Colby 11. And what we learned is important truth is every time food showed up in the lounge of our floor from that point forward, we said, who made this, right? Where did this come from? Who, who is behind this? Because the question of who matters, and Jesus is addressing this question head on. I think even before we get to that, it's important to recognize that this isn't the first time that we're introduced to the Holy Spirit. When we read the Bible, he is active and involved from the very outset. We discover his presence and, and his activity from the very beginning. In fact, from eternity past, really. We did, we did a series, this has probably been six or seven years ago, called Ruach, which is the Hebrew word for, for that's used, it's translated wind or spirit um, that's used in the Old Testament. If you look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God, the Ruach of God, was hovering over the face of the waters. Later on in Job, we see his his creative activity, Job chapter 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. We see his creative activity again in the Psalms. 
chapter 3, verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath, the ruach of his mouth, all their hosts. So the point is that the person of the Holy Spirit exists eternally like God. The person of the Holy Spirit is, is creative in his actions like God because he is God. Specifically, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, Jesus his Son, and the Holy Spirit are God in three unique persons. This is who the Holy Spirit is. But Jesus now elaborates on this for us. He helps us further understand the nature of this promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit here in chapter 14. He says this again. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Another helper. This phrase has been particularly helpful for me in grasping who the Holy Spirit is. The, the, the Greek here and, and these, this phrase is allos paraclete. Allos paraclete. That word allos means another of the same kind. And paraclete is the word that's translated helper. Or in, in the NRSV, I think it is, it translates that word as advocate. See, this, this is a legal term. It means coming alongside of a person to speak in, in his or her defense. So Jesus is telling us that the Holy Spirit is, is one who is like him, who is fully God, and will continue to do the work that he has done to defend us. Gary Burge, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, says, says Jesus is thus a paraclete, a, a helper or an advocate, who is sending a second paraclete. This means the ongoing work of the Spirit will be the continuation of the work of Jesus during the disciples' lifetime. See, so the key to knowing the Holy Spirit, the key to understanding his objective in our lives is knowing Jesus. The, the key to knowing the second advocate is knowing the first advocate. It is a continuation of his work. This is the person of the Holy Spirit. This, and this is important here, because the Holy Spirit is not just this impersonal force that's hovering over the stratosphere. The implication of, of per, the personhood of the Holy Spirit means that it's, our connection to him is relational. So it means that we can be known by him and that, that, he, that we can know him and he can know us. Have you ever been in a, in a scenario, maybe something like this or a, a, a seminar, you hear someone teaching from scripture and there could be thousands of people in the room and you get the very real sense that that person is speaking directly at you? I, I sat one time at, at Willow Creek years ago at, at, a, at a seminar, Andy Stanley was preaching, 8,000 people, every seat packed. And I sat there and I thought, this person is talking directly towards me. See, that is the activity of the Holy Spirit. He knows me, and he's allowing the truth of that person that is up there speaking to penetrate my heart and to make change, do transformational work in me because it's personal, because I can be in a relationship with him, because he knows me, and he invites me to know him. So this is, this is very different than sort of the, the Eastern idea of God as this impersonal force. And so the result in... in Eastern philosophy is that you would meditate to empty your mind and to allow yourself to tap into kind of this nebulous force that's out there. But Christianity is almost exactly the opposite. Christianity isn't about emptying ourselves, but it's rather filling ourselves up with the truth of God's worth, with, with the, the Holy Spirit's activity in our lives, with him as a person. The Spirit is a personal, he is a person, he is personal, so you and I can be in relationship with him. Which then ultimately leads to this third thing that I think Jesus is so emphatically teaching us here in these words, and that is the presence of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's take just a moment here to, to talk about what it is that the Holy Spirit provides. Look again at, at these words of Jesus. I'm going to go through a, kind of a smattering of different verses here in, verse, in chapter 14. Again, at the beginning, he says, I will give you, he will give you another helper. This is verse 16, to be with you forever. Verse 17, for he dwells with you 
and will be in you. Verse 18. Uh, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Verse 23. And we will come to him and make our home with him. See, the Holy Spirit in our lives is the, the very presence of God with us, in us. And if you study the, the presence of God, this is one of the themes that is you can trace throughout the entire narrative of Scripture, throughout the entire story. This is what Adam and Eve experienced in the garden and, and lost as a result of sin was, was the presence of God with them. This is what the people of Israel enjoyed as they entered the tabernacle and into the temple, God dwelling among them. And this is what, what they lost with their disobedience and the removal of his presence. It's God's presence that the people of God longed to have restored as they waited for the arrival of the Messiah. And now this is, this is the provision of God's presence that is being realized with the coming of the Holy Spirit when we put our faith in Jesus. So what Jesus is telling us is that the Holy Spirit quite literally takes up residence in our lives as Christians. Allow that to soak in for a moment. He takes up residence in our lives. When we say to each other something like, hey, God be with you. Have you ever said some version of that to somebody? That's, that's not wishful thinking. That's, that's not just some sort of like phrase that we throw around. That is, the, that is the statement of a reality, of a promise that has been delivered on. Maybe perhaps more appropriately, we should say God is with you. Hey, God is with you. That's a powerful truth that changes the way that we live our lives, not a request. And it's accomplished through the arrival, through the person of the Holy Spirit. He is with you always, no exceptions. In your worst moments, he's with you. When the pain is most severe, he is with you. When you are, are celebrating and there's joy, he's with you. When you feel like you've lost hope, he's with you. When you're watching your kids struggle, he's with you. When you are, are worried about your marriage, he's with you. When you are celebrating his goodness and his provision, he's with you. When I was teaching my daughters to ride their bike, I can't remember which one specifically this was, but one of them would get particularly nervous when, when I let go of the seat and kind of stopped running. So when they would take off. And it would start off great, but as soon as they became aware that I wasn't there, um, they would get nervous and they would, they would uh, slip or fall or just kind of put their feet down and stop. And so what I realized is that I needed to continue to run with my daughter. And so I would let go of the seat. And as she started to take away, I would just continue to jog as best as I could. And if you guys know me, I don't love jogging. So this was a little bit, but I'm just right there behind her. And I would constantly say, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. As if she would run away, as, she, as I'm running around our cul-de-sac, just saying, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Until such a point that, that she could go out on her own. That's where the metaphor draws down. We never go out on our own. But you see what the implication is. This is what, God, this is what Jesus is promising here. This is... This is the almighty creator, holy God, who takes up residence, who gives, promises his presence with us, and he is saying to us, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. This is the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is what's been available. And what he's doing, we're gonna, this is where we're going next. His activity in our lives, it's going to, he is going to work to glorify the Father and he's going to work to make you and I more like his son. That's what he's going to start to produce in us. And we're going to look more at that. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here together. God, we thank you that your spirit is present with us, in us. That that is a promise that you have confirmed with, with certainty and with the power of the resurrection. And God, we, we pray that we will be 
aware of growing in our understanding of your activity in our lives, how you are gonna glorify your name through us and how you will create us to be men and women who are being shaped into the image of Jesus. Continue this work in us. Make us receptive and moldable clay. It's in your name we pray. Amen.